Fasten your seatbelts. The foremost authority on 9-11. The best-selling author of Methodical Illusion. And a researcher extraordinaire. Rebecca Roth is about to step up to the microphone and launch into Reality Check, where the light will shine brightly upon the truth. Live from Palm Springs, California, it's the Rebecca Roth Show, starring Rebecca Roth. And I'm your host, Ramjet. I hope you're in a pool of very cold water. I will be later. <laughs> I see California is having a record heat. Even the, you know, the place that one place in the world that has the perfect weather most of the year, San Diego, cooking. Um, it must be really hot there. It is oh. really hot here. <laughs> And well, I should say it will be really hot here. Uh huh. I bet you're out there. It is just kind of hot now at the moment. <laughs> I bet you're out there taking pictures of cactus, huh? <laughs> no comment. Uh, no. All right. Well, welcome to the Rebecca Roth Show. I'm so glad you could figure out how to get out of the heat and dial in. Okay. Well, um, here we are. Uh, gee. Almost kind of coming in the middle of July. Everybody wants to know when's book four coming out. But you know what? Every single week, I get email from people. It's like I just discovered you. Um, <clears throat> so for those of you who are just discovering uh, Rebecca Roth, um, so that you know, I have the fourth book in the novel series, the Methodical series, uh, coming out. The first book, Methodical Illusion, uh, a shock of my life. I think about four months after I published it, uh, George Nori called and we did an interview in March of 2015. That's still on his YouTube channel, apparently, because um, I get a lot of people that are through Coast to Coast AM. Uh, what that kind of did was push that book into number four at Amazon, or number nine at Amazon. And um, it sort of left everybody, wow, tell me more, tell me more. So um, we're working now on releasing the fourth book in the series. So, But you know what it didn't do is it, you know, you'd think that a book that hits, you know, in the top 10 on Amazon at any point in time, you would get uh, calls from various you know, <laughs> big name publishers. Now, you know, I'm pretty good friends with your publisher and he, you know, he does a great job and you know, I don't know why you would ever want to leave him because he had, you know, brought you out of obscurity but you know he's still small potatoes i mean he's uh, pretty insignificant in terms of pub publishing companies and you would think that somebody that has a book that's in the top 10 that you know some of the larger publishing houses would have called and they didn't because they aren't interested in that information well this big part of the cover-up and i think that um after this book i'm gonna do um I have planned, not right away, but I have planned to do a nonfiction or two because I think it's really important that people really understand the gravity of what happened on 9-11 and who did it. And trust me, by the end of book four, which will be released, I think September 1st, it looks like everybody's a go. So it's not just me, it's the editor. And um, I know I what date I have with her. I know how long it usually takes her and the process from there to get the uh, a proof copy and make sure every all the pages are in right everybody's done their job correctly and get it on Amazon well you know that's probably a pretty good idea because sometimes people I know uh, write to you and say they are confused about stuff I think they get the facts about 9-11 correct but they sometimes have a, a problem um, conflating some of the characters in the book with reality I mean after all people like Dante uh, was never on the airplanes and uh, Vera was never on the airplanes and so she wasn't there even though they talk about it and, and people get a little bit confused with the nonfiction and sometimes it causes them to read them again which is a good thing because they get the truth out of that but I think if you were to do a nonfiction where you just kind of lay it all out there uh, that's probably a good idea you probably should do that yeah, uh, I've had lots of people, you know, a lot of men, they just don't want to read a book. And, you know, when I first set out to, to write a novel just for fun, because I was in my retirement, I never really gave it much thought. Um, I, just, I was going to write about life as a flight attendant and some of the stuff, you know, some of my own experiences, some of the stuff that... Coffee, tea, or me? Yeah, kind of like that on steroids and so I, I set out and I thought well, I'll just write a fun book you know so ladies can read because a lot of women wanted to be a flight attendant at some point in their life and it wasn't until I discovered the 
uh, about 10 of the hijackers still alive, living and well, uh, that it, it shocked me into, uh, I, it red-pilled me, <laughs> let's just say that. And then as I kept looking, uh, t as a flight attendant, I, I was like, well, how come I never saw this? How come this article from BBC has been out there since then, you know, just a you know, week after or two after 9-11? How come I didn't know that? How come we never talked about this in the airline? How come we didn't get this in training? How come they acted so weird in training when we asked the main question that not one crew member gave up in their silly phone calls to their parents. <laughs> Hijack protocol were very, very set in stone, step-by-step -step procedure. It had not changed since the very, very early 70s, late 60s. It hadn't changed. The code words were the same. It has now changed since 9-11. But... You mean since you wrote your book? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I have a few enemies at American Airlines. <laughs> I have a lot of friends there, though, uh, and United, actually. So, but yeah, it's just interesting to see uh, all of this stuff that, that has gone on. And my own uh, red pilling. So if you want to go through it step by step, uh, this is how I woke up. And I, at the beginning of this, you'll see the first three chapters, literally, or the first two are literally taking you into the airline life. Now, I know some trolls claim I never flew, but I have the bunions to prove it. Um, it it's, it's weird that my airline career is such a threat to people that were disinformation agents set into the 9-11 truth movement very, very early on. Well, I think it's really more than your airline career. Um, I think it's the fact that you have exposed things that nobody else has gotten anywhere near. If you look at the truth movements, you know, they talk about pretty much the same kinds of things and, you know, it's opinions to a large degree and it's, you know, kind of out there, but you kind of nailed it. And you talked about things that in the, after a long after 9-11 had happened, you came forward with stuff that was just out of this world. And that was what has became threatening to them. That and the fact that, you know, you had a following, people paid attention to what you had to say, and they had to discredit you in any way they possibly could. And so and they some used still are. Yeah, you know, and so they used your <laughs> the weekly show your airline Hate career. Roth. <laughs> your airline career and anything you had to say. And then they made up stuff about you, much like what happens in the political world today with with people that uh, they want to discredit. Yep. It's exactly, it's a, it's a Saul Alinsky response, rules for radicals. You can read it and see exactly what they do. And that's what, that's definitely trolls do that. And you can see now, uh, even the president of the United States is trolled every single moment of the day. There are trolls. Uh, when I learned that even a woman who was spinning her own yarn had yarn trolls, I'm like, okay. <laughs> but the it's true. The larger your audience, the more goofballs you pick up. Now, what that's done for me is, you know, I thought I was going to be uh, battling the NSA. <laughs> So I used a, a lot of security on all my computers and devices. I don't carry a cell phone, so you can't contact me. And you can't find my uh, locations because I, I uh, learned how to do uh, multiple layers of security. And I thought it was, you know, for the government. But I guess so now it is for the government because one of the things that's happened uh, recently is that Google has attacked my membership site. So if you go there using Chrome as a browser, you'll probably see a huge red page that says, this woman is trying to steal your financial information. The membership is, by the way, the membership is still on, on a reduced rate, 30% off. There's, it's right there how to do it. If you sign in, then you can have access to a you 15% know, discount on the books, which are also on sale. So you can get 15% on, on a sale price even. So you get a really great deal, uh, but you'll have to use a different browser. Or if you use Google and you want to keep using Google, there's a, a text on there that says details. And then there's an option to go to the site anyway. I am not phishing. When you sign up for a membership, it goes directly into PayPal. So if PayPal's phishing you, well, that's their problem. <laughs> I don't think they are. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what's happening. But this is an attack, and you have to understand who Google represents. And why are they attacking a woman, an old retired bird like myself, uh, over three, soon to be four novels? You have to ask yourself that, because what does that say? I mean, it's powerful when a corporation as huge as Google 
and maybe they'll go on to other uh, browsers, Bing or whoever. But it started with Google, and that's a huge uh, outfit. So if you Google search the books, or I mean, it's buried under a whole bunch of trash by trolls. <laughs> well, that's true. Negative but, information now. But if that really doesn't indicate that we're, you're right over the target and that you're saying things that are absolutely correct, I don't know what does because they're going to fight this and fight it as hard as they possibly can because they don't want that information and the the research that you continually do. I mean, you know, I've known you for a long time and you've you're you're always in the research mode. I mean, you know, you you drive down the street and uh, you know you're looking at things that. Uh, always relate back to 9-11. So the fact that Google is, uh, you know, trying to discredit you tells me a lot. I mean, they're a big, big company, and you're not. <laughs> and very connected to DARPA and the United States government. Oh, imagine that. Uh, so again, I mean, it's just, uh, it's fascinating, as I never thought my retirement would be um, so exciting. But what it's done is caused a, a secure situation for me, a security problem, actually. So in order to stay secure, to write this next book and to get this book out, and this is the last one of the series. The novel series is over, and you won't need any more than the, <laughs> the last chapter of this book will secure and cement exactly who did what. Now, there may be how more, and when more information and that you know you <laughs> uncover, but you'll figure out a different way to deliver it. Exactly. It won't be in a novel format, and uh, Dante Wilcox won't. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, the, I think one of the set-asides, not just my airline career, but what happened after um, the Coast to Coast AM interview is that a whole bunch of people, uh, I guess, heard that. He has a large audience. And um, I started to get people coming forward for that were – you know, other aviation people, pilots, flight attendants, people that knew crew members, people that were related to crew members, uh, air traffic controllers that knew that day something was wrong. Some of them made recordings. Uh, and they just knew there was something wrong with the story. I mean, it's just amazing. Police officers, firefighters from New York. I mean, it has truly been an amazing thing that people that now that in retrospect, I guess, you know, it's always hindsight, hindsight is <laughs> always 2020. So you, you see what happened. And so they contact me and, uh, it, that's what's really brought out the, the third and fourth books actually, um, is that people... Because you were done after you wrote the first one. Yeah. Well, I thought so. And I thought 20 people might read that book. <laughs> I never dreamed it'd go into the top 10 at Amazon Books, but um, it did. And so, and there was so much more. And after that, I got a terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data. Now, there's one thing that's interesting to me uh, in the FOIA data is that it took a while, but um, whenever you save something onto a computer, uh, it's time and date stamped. So uh, when stuff went into the FAA computers, they were time and date stamped. And one of the things in particular, and this is in the appendix section of uh, the second book, Methodical Deception, is that the, the voice file of what they claimed was the hijacker, but they called him a terrorist. And that caught my attention because in aviation at the time, we didn't have any training or ever discuss terrorism. It was unheard of. Our issue was hijacking, taking our passengers and our airplane and ourselves somewhere we didn't want to go that wasn't on our schedule, that wasn't our scheduled overnight. <laughs> so, well, that makes sense because, you know, when you look back on the airline industry up until 9-11, really all the problems that they'd had dealt with hijackers, which were doing exactly that. They were trying to get extort money out of the airline or is trying to extort money out of, you know, the government or somebody and then take the plane someplace where they thought they'd be safe. And so that's how the airline dealt with that because these people were hijackers. You know, there were, there may be a couple of uh, situations where there were terrorists on board, but they were always in places like Entebbe or, you know, you know, not, not in the United States and not things that you generally had to deal with. And so I understand what you're saying. I can see why you, you the red flags would have gone up when you heard the word terrorist because that wasn't part of the airline lingo. Well, it did catch my attention. And so when I looked at it and I saw that not only had the FAA put a copyright on it, <laughs> but they also uploaded it to their main computer at 6.37 a.m. on 9-11. And quite frankly, just in case you forget this, 
Flight 11 was the first plane to leave Boston that was involved supposedly that day. It left at 7.59. Uh, you got to ask yourself this. How did the FAA headquarters know that the hijacker would really be a terrorist at 6.37 a.m. on September 11th, 2001? Well, when I got to that point, I was like, oh boy. So then I started to look at the terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data that I had. And I started to look at all the radar files and other reports. Some of them are on Word documents, some are on, on uh, an application I can't open, but I've got plenty that I can open. And what did I find? But meta tags, metadata, time and date stamps of prior to the hour of all four of those planes crashing, or even in some cases, pushing back from the gate for takeoff. Now, you have to ask yourself, uh, how did that happen? Well, then it starts to look like a, what they call in the industry a school play, <laughs> a hoax. And if you haven't ever read about Operation Northwoods, what 9-11 was is essentially Operation Northwoods uh, version, you know, 4.0 or something, uh, an improved version, and, it, and, in, and a version that was taken uh, to that level. Well, you know, I, I know that you've had the terabyte of information uh, for quite some time. And my question to you really is, have you gone through all of that? And, and the reason I ask is because I was talking to your publisher who actually, if somebody buys that information, uh, they get a hard drive and they get all the terabyte of information. But it takes your publisher, you know, eight or nine hours to copy all that. A terabyte of information is a lot of information. And so my question is, is have I read it? All? Have you read it all? Have you gone through it all? Or are you still find, um, finding time to do that? I am. I read it often. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is that I have figured out how things are hidden, where the, where to look and where things, how things are labeled. And so if, I, and now that I know what I know and how the whole thing was set up, and how it proceeded and how it was covered up. Uh, now I know more what to look for. If you, lo if you look at this with your, in your mind, the official government version, you will never find the truth. But if you understand that the airplanes were indeed landed. Now, originally I thought they were remote control landed because of Betty Ong saying they couldn't communicate with the cockpit they weren't answering their phone because once the remote control flight termination system uh, uh, took a hold of the aircraft to land it, quote, remotely in the event of a hijacking, and both America and United had that put on. And it was a, a device that was sold in the early 90s. Uh, Boeing offered it through this company, SPC Corporation. They make the flight termination system or the remote control flying uh system for our drones that are still droning the Middle East now. So it's the same kind of guy. Coincidentally, that same person who was the CEO of that company was also the comptroller of the United States Pentagon. And coincidentally, he's also a rabbi and a Jewish and Israeli citizen, a dual citizen, Rabbi Dov Zakheim. And so when I saw these connections and I first saw this, I thought, well, there's no way that, that uh, they could have done this. They had to be on the ground to make the phone calls. But how did they get control of the planes? Well, eventually, we uh, uncovered it all. But originally, I thought it was the remote control system because uh, we were told that if the remote control system was ever uh, initiated and taking over the, flying the aircraft remotely, uh, that we would not be able to communicate with each other. Now, every jump seat has an interphone. Uh, and you can make a PA or you can call other flight attendant stations. Like if let's just say we're all in turbulence or we're getting ready for an emergency landing and we're in our jump seats and something new pops up that one of the flight attendants can see. Let's just say an engine catches on fire and the person aft of the engine uh, can see it. So she can pick up the phone and call all the flight attendant telephones that are sitting right there in their jump seats and they're strapped in for the emergency and say, there's a fire on the right side of the aircraft in engine such and such. And or something like that. Or if there's something, you know, that's happened to the where she's at or in that's the case with anybody. Um, 
So we can do that. We can call the, also the cockpit, but in using the remote control system, basically all of our inter uh, phone communication was not going to work. And that's why I thought at first in methodical illusion, I, I had uh, Vera Hansen and Jim Bowman, two fictional characters. They're, they're not anybody I know. They're just a combination of everybody I ever knew applying, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and I've never had a dog. So <laughs> and she has a golden retriever that kind of is a, a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've never had one since I am not Vera Hansen, so don't get confused. That part is the novel part. Um, if I had any. You're really Betty Young, right? <laughs> I'm not Chinese either. Um, so, anyway, it, it's just a, a kind of a fascinating thing what happened to me as time went by and more people started contacting with more information. I changed uh, from the aircraft being remotely controlled. It may or may not have been. It, let me just say it to you this way so you kind of get a hint. It didn't have to be remotely controlled. But it did have to be, all four aircraft had to be on the ground. Now, a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday show, I know I let this out, so I'm going to let it out again. Because one of the things I just recently found in and the uh, FOIA data. And at the time, the first time through, and I know I've read, well, I haven't read every file because there's a gazillion files, but I'm sure I probably read this. It didn't make any sense to me. But now that I know what I know, uh, an, an American Airlines dispatcher was watching. Now, they have a different way of watching uh, the airplanes than air traffic control. Dispatchers have a other, couple other things. There's ACARS, which is a text message system computer that's there, and it pings when you ping an airplane. Uh, you call, it's like a, it very much like text messaging, messaging a cell phone, but it goes through the uh, flight management uh, computer system. It's a little, uh, looks kind of like a Starbucks receipt. <laughs> it comes out on a thermal paper and it's printed. And, it'll, and if the dispatch wants to know, or, or there, let's just say there's a death in the family on a flight for a flight attendant, or there's a family emergency, that's often how the company would contact us is through the ACAR system. But that ACAR system pings back the location of the airplane also. So what I saw was an air, a dispatcher at American Airlines calling to air traffic control in New York, trying to figure out why Flight 77, which supposedly took off from Newark, hung a left and started going westbound. But why in the world was Flight 77 showing up in New York City? Well, I know why. Because they were going as direct flight from Newark to Westover. And it's exactly the right timing. So I have the radar. I know where it went. I have all kinds of other software that I can, you know, look at. And now if, if you want to do this for fun, you can download the flight uh, radar uh, 24 application on your phone or your computer. And you can go and just go to Boston and go follow, you know, a 76 or a 777 or even a 75. You can follow any aircraft that takes off from Boston and that's headed toward the West Coast. And you can see how long it takes them and you will be guaranteed to see that in 20 minutes, there's no, no problem at all. They could have been on the ground in Westover and they were. Same thing with the other flights. You can follow them and I've done it. A thousand times. You know why I did it a thousand times? I wanted to be wrong. When I first discovered that, wait a minute, all these calls on cell phones, cell phones didn't work at altitude in 2001. And so I was like, wait a minute. And I kept reading all these, you know, CNN, ABC, NBC, all these September 1st or September 11th, September 12th, September 13th, all these wonderful stories about these cell phone calls. And then I started to see that the FBI decided, uh-oh, we have screwed up here because cell phones don't work at altitude. Let's start changing the story. And that's out there too. So I realized, why are they changing the story? What's going on here? And then I realized exactly where the planes were all landed. Since then, I've had about, I don't know, four or five eyewitnesses or ear witnesses to these planes landing. And when civilians in Western Massachusetts saw them, 
they were initially kind of freaked out. They thought that there's something wrong because they're used to seeing military planes coming into Westover and commercial planes landing at Bradley, which is about 24 miles due south of Westover. And so the people in Western Massachusetts, they're used to seeing uh, normal flight paths. They aren't used to seeing these planes flying under the radar, so close to the ground that every single one of them was uh, just assumed that this plane was going to be crashing within seconds or minutes, maybe two or three. Uh, dangerously low to the ground, frighteningly so, uh, rattled their buildings, scared everybody inside the building. I mean, that's something that you don't get unless you're at a golf course at the you know end of a runway or something, uh, or you know parked there watching the planes land. And you, if you've ever done that, you know how loud that is. Uh, when those planes hit the reversers and uh, are about ready to touch down on the ground at the end of a runway. And I know that a lot of third world countries, they like to do that because sometimes coming in, you can see them. Well, you sort of answered my question in a roundabout way. I guess what you're really saying is in order to read all of the uh, FOIA data and digest it all, you'll be a older, grayer haired, grayer haired <laughs> than you already are, old lady when you finish. But you said something really very interesting that in the process of doing that, you learned how that data was put together, where they have hid things, how they have done things. And, and I think that is, you know, speaks a lot to what it is you've done over the years in terms of uh, gleaning from that information, uh, the kinds of things that you've had. Now, I know you offer people to buy that. And I've mentioned that, that uh, they can purchase that and they get a hard drive and they get all the data. But you really don't recommend it. I mean, I noticed that you talk about selling the books and joining behind the galley curtain, but you don't ever say buy the FOIA data. And I think the reason you don't is because you know, it's just too complicated for the average run-of-the-mill person. Now, if you've got some kind of background, maybe it's a good thing to have. Or if you've got a lot of time, because yeah. you'll be in a gray-haired old lady or old <laughs> man by the time you finish. But it's not something that, you know, just the average run-of-the-mill person is going to be able to pick up and glean because it's like a huge puzzle that you have to put together. And if you like puzzles, then it's a good thing. But, you know, I don't think I would ever recommend anybody getting the FOIA data. And I know if they call the publisher and ask him about it, he'll probably try to talk you out of it because um, it's, you know, it's not cheap. I mean, it's $199, I think, for for all of that. Of course, you do get the hard drive, which is, you know, about an 80 or $90 hard drive. And, you know, it takes him, like I said, eight or nine hours to copy all that. So it's, it's a labor intensive process, but it's a know, lot of data, but it is a lot of data. And you have figured out how to interpret that, how to read it, which is really commendable. And I think that's great. Well, what I learned actually is, and I think that this is the I don't know, the step out of the matrix, I don't know. But the official story of 19 Arabs hijacking the planes with plastic box cutters uh, is so different from what really happened, what could have happened, what uh, what really would happen uh, on board a pressurized aircraft. Uh, for instance, just uh, spraying mace. If you spray mace in a pressurized cabin, I don't care where you're sitting, even the pilots are going to feel the effects of it. Everyone is. And you know what? Coincidentally, they never mentioned that the hijackers brought gas masks on with them, but they did on almost every flight say that they had sprayed pepper spray or mace or something like that. And they couldn't breathe in only one section of the plane. And that, my friends, is not correct. And there was a, that was another red flag for me to go, oh, wait a minute. Well, that's not what would happen. And immediately as a flight attendant, I thought about, you know, leaving Honolulu with all that, you know, puka puka souvenir cologne. They or, you know, leaving Puerto Rico and somebody dropping their bottle of rum or a baby poo-pooing. Or, or flying out of San Francisco, the <laughs> poop capital of the world. <laughs> or, you know, something happening that made a big stinky. And uh, it, it's, it's through the whole aircraft. So if there's a stinky on board or a toxic uh, gas or whatever uh, you'd call that, aerosol, uh, you're going to get it everywhere. And one of the things that I saw is that Betty Ong, who was on the phone for almost a half an hour, and her friend uh, Amy Sweeney, uh, was on the phone off and on for, you know, 20 minutes or so. Neither one of them complained about the effects of that. And I went, wait a minute. The same with on um, flight 175, uh, which we have a real solid eyewitness for. Um, but there's a guy on there who happened to work. Uh, he was a vice president of um, time trade 
uh, International Waltham, Massachusetts, and he uh, he was that's a by the way a big DoD uh, subcontractor and contracting company, and they get most of their contracts through now Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. Coincidentally, both of the eyewitnesses supposedly eyewitnesses from United 175. Both of them were in, involved with um, large uh, shadow government or DOD uh, government contractors, that sort of thing. One worked for MITRE and the other for Time Trade uh, of Waltham, Massachusetts. Okay, so so when he said that they uh, paid, sprayed pepper spray or mace or something and people were vomiting all around him, but you know, he was talking to his dad. He wasn't, he never coughed. He never showed any signs of any problem of this uh, nasty aerosol that was sprayed either. And I thought, wait a minute. And then that guy said something that only he would know if he had been told uh, the, the scenario, the, the game plan, the, it's like a war game in a sense. Uh, <clears throat> he told his dad on the phone, he called by his cell phone also, and being right over about five to 7,000 foot elevation, uh, altitude, right over the Hudson River on the right side of the airplane, he could see the Statue of Liberty and Manhattan. He told his dad, they, he, he was convinced that the hijackers who could not speak English were going to take that plane and fly it to Chicago into a building. Now, if you think about this, after, uh, you know, well, even after uh, the first explosion hit the North Tower, everybody thought first, and I have document after document after document claiming it was a helicopter, a Sikorsky helicopter that had left the Pentagon that was down on Wall Street, that it was a, a Cessna or a small aircraft or a helicopter, and just about anything but a 767. Now, if you've been listening to this show from the beginning, beginning this to this point we've been uh, basically 30 minutes and that's how long betty ong talked <laughs> exactly. and you know that you Good know point. you think about that that's kind of that's a long unbelievable time. really that she would have done that but here's something else to keep in mind if the hijackers as official government story went were on all four of those planes and they took those planes both two of them into the uh, twin towers one into the pentagon and one into shanksville those hijackers would have never allowed anybody to make phone calls. And they'd have just done what they did because that was the most important thing for them, so to speak. And you, we wouldn't have known a thing about 9-11 other than the fact that these planes crashed and they would have... It was necessary to it get the phone calls out. It was absolutely important to have the phone calls. It's the script. It's uh, the Hollywood story. It's the script. Because without the phone calls and lots of phone calls, particularly from Fi Flight 93, which were, you know, all heart-wrenching and emotion-grabbing you know, emotion kinds of things, it, we wouldn't have known. And they needed to have it known. They needed to have the world know what it was that they were trying to pull off. And, and me, that's why the phone calls that's were there. That's true. And let me just say this, that the planners were used to flying government aircraft that are equipped with the ability to make phone calls to the ground, whether that's a cell. I mean, I just was listening to somebody talking about Air Force One the other day. There was something like 20-some television sets. That guy can watch any channel around the world. So there's equipment like that the... Um, government planes might be equipped to make cell phone calls even they could have been in 2001 i'm sure they were because if you're running let's say the cia uh and you need to contact somebody you need to be able to contact them you know right away sometimes if you're in a plane well that's the way it is and that was one of their first mistakes was claiming that all of these people uh, called using cell phones. Another thing I've seen covered up, and Tom Burnett, who called his wife, happened to be a flight attendant for Delta, he somehow knew one minute before the official hijacking took place that the plane was hijacked, but he also said there was a gun on board and a bomb. And so you have all of these uh, weapons. You have uh, an al almost, if you keep reading through uh, the through the story, you just keep reading through all the data, which is what I do, is you see that there were box cutters, knives, bombs, guns, mace and or pepper spray, 
all of those things were not allowed to go through security. Maybe and security took the day off that day. <laughs> It was a holiday. <laughs> well, I've even found all of the interviews uh, that were done with all of the people that worked security at Boston Logan, uh, at Newark, and uh, Washington Dulles. So that, and that's kind of interesting too, because a lot of them were new immigrants. Some of them had been here about a year. A lot of them were Muslim. Uh, so I'm questioning now the the because uh, because I know that 9/11 was planned long before George W. Bush got into the White House. And I know that the uh, people who ran security, Huntley USA, is a subsidiary of an Israeli company whose CEO, owner, <laughs> founder, was sitting in prison, ICTS Corporation, and that they chose in the year or two prior to 9-11 to fill uh, most of the uh, security people and this was when security was, uh, you know, run not by the government. Well, you know, after the fact, I think peop uh, people that planned 9-11 actually realized that they goofed. I know they it, know. <laughs> when it came to the cell phones and to the air phones and whatnot and the communication, which I just mentioned was so important. It had to happen. But if you'll notice in the movies that happened since 9-11, Hollywood has helped proliferate that story. I remember a lot of the uh, 24 shows that, you know, I've always enjoyed watching. Jack Bauer could always talk on his cell phone to the president or whoever it was he wanted to talk to. Clara's could be connection. Absolutely no problem. And they just magnified that in an effort to help people realize that, yo, oh, you can talk on cell phones. Well, of course, now you can. And so that's not going to be a big deal. But, you know, for those 10 or 15 years after 9-11, Hollywood continued to perpetuate the crazy nonsense that cell phones could work on airplanes, and they can't, and they couldn't. Operation Mockingbird. And this, if you understand the both the connection with the CIA and the Mossad and Hollywood, then you understand why they've, why they've continued to do this crazy stuff. And you remember, uh, they've chose to do a movie or two about Flight 93, well, Flight 93 was already parked at the ground almost 10 minutes or more before the phone call started. That's how Tom Burnett made a mistake. And those mistakes in the timeline are where they always make mistakes. Now, this is the same kind of thing we're seeing now with the hoax that the FBI has put together. Not just the FBI, the CIA, they work together hand in hand. And the MI6, same people that were involved in 9-11. Uh, with the Russia hoax, claiming that Donald Trump is a Russian agent and that he got some kind of help, but nobody can find it. Uh, he's so clever that uh, he's hidden it all from the best, the FBI. Okay, so this is just nonsense, but it's the same kind of thing. The timeline is flawed. And so what you find is people like Susan Rice and Peter Strzok and stuff making false timelines and that's kind of one of the things that i found the holes were in in the foia data once i realized when the planes were making phone calls they all were on the ground at westover they all were nobody went to cleveland except delta 1989 and that's another story and actually that story is in uh, the third book, Methodical Conclusion, and more of it is going to be in Methodical ah, <laughs> Number Four. <laughs> methodical Number Four. I'm not even giving away the title yet because, uh, first off, I'm going to do that with the members first, and then they get to see the artwork and they get to see the website first. So if you want to become a member and you want to see the picture of what the uh, book is going to look like, uh, it all will happen. Um, uh, over through the membership site. Is the fourth book public. called Methodical Insanity? <laughs> it should be. Um, so yeah, it's kind of fascinating to see what, what goes on here. So what else do I need to say? Oh, uh, about that fourth book, it should be available September 1st, give or take a day or two. It may come out a few days earlier than that. But if it does, I will, if you follow us on Vimeo, please, because uh, Google owns YouTube and uh my YouTube channel, I look at that YouTube channel. I do it for a lot of people that can't get Vimeo in their country. Uh, but I look at it as uh, just as temporary as uh, it can be. Um, 
So please follow us either on Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, or through RebeccaRothShow.com. Uh, become a member, or you can actually go over to Behind the Galley Curtain, hit Saturday shows and watch those there. They're embedded. You don't have to be a member. There's uh, several free uh, pages over there on that uh, Behind the Galley Curtain.com page, the membership site. Now, have you already started booking shows on uh, people's shows for doing your book at all? I haven't been doing any interviews, but I know I've got some coming up. We'll talk about that when it gets a little closer. Um, but yeah, it was September 1st is the, the release, and it, that, I was planning to have that out, I thought, in March. <laughs> but because of my back injury and having to travel to stay alive uh, after, you know, having a drone show up where I was, it was pretty disheartening. And then having Google do this, I mean, it's like, okay, well, they're serious. And I really would like to live long enough to get a nonfiction, at least one, out so you can really see... Um, the data so you can see you know i'm not just somebody that has an opinion i use a terabyte of freedom of information act data and a lot more so there's there are literally thousands of pages of fbi documents as well 302s from initial interviews there's a lot of information in those as well and i keep reading those also because as i have continued along. I've had a lot of people that were employees from American and United and other airlines that were in positions in dispatch and operations and crew scheduling and other uh, re reservations and other uh, aspects of those companies that had an experience that day. Let me just say it th to you that way. Had an experience that day with a government agency that was out of the <laughs> out of this world, out of the norm. And so I've had a lot of people share information uh, about the passenger manifests and uh, the, the real information that was really uh, out there and that's been hidden from you. And so it's been really, to me, very fascinating to see how, how many people have come forward and um, had shared information. And, and uh, you know, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I've never been a conspiracy nut. I don't, I use government uh, data or uh, you know, S302s from the FBI, watch the many changes in them. Uh, stuff that's been put into court for Zachariah Musawi, the so-called 20th hijacker. The, and it goes beyond, it goes clear back into the Oklahoma City bombing information. I mean, this is, this is not, it's all connected, is what I'm saying. It is all connected. And it's all connected to the same organizations and agencies that are behind the current Russia Trump hoax. And so if you know what you're looking at and you understand, you can see there are mistakes and missteps in a timeline. When did they start to do this and why did they not follow protocol? For instance, the FBI never put Hillary Clinton's people under oath and called for. I mean, that's just craziness. That's breaking protocol. Why? And so when you see protocol broken, like I did with the FAA uh, hijack protocol, you have to go, well, why would they do that? Why would a girl who'd been flying a dozen years, we do yearly recertification training. And in that training, we go over hijack training. We had no terrorism training. Uh, there was none. And if you've ever read about a flight attendant that was in terrorist training, you're reading a lie. And there was one, actually. But that's not where she really was. And that's not what she was really doing. So uh, now that we know what we know, it's it's fascinating stuff to see. And you can start to look now. Um, and a, a lot of people contact me. I was like, uh, after reading the third book, they really feel that the veil of, of truth has been lifted. They feel like they can now digest this. And it literally was a step-by-step -step process. And for me... I can say this, if you read the books in order, illusion, deception, conclusion, and then the fourth book, you will be going through red pilling just like me. And just, so you're going to uh, tape a red pill onto the fourth book? <laughs> the cover. <laughs> on the cover. So if you buy a whole set, you get a free red pill. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a Sudafed. Um, yeah, it's just a, kind of a fascinating thing to see. Um, all the people that have shared just vital information that didn't go along with the government's official conspiracy. 
Um, because well, what's fascinating is these people <laughs> who, who had this information had no place to take it. I mean, you're not going to call the FBI and say, hey, guess what? You know, I know this, this, and this, and that, and whatnot about, you know, Flight 11 and, or Flight 93. The FBI is not going to want that information, partly because, one, they already know the truth, and two, their job is to cover it up because they're the most corrupt organization in the history of the world. That's true. And, you know, it's interesting, too, that what happened, and I have this in data also, what happened uh, on 9-11 was highly unusual for an airplane incident. Normally, the chain of command is that the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, and then the FBI or the uh, FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, get the data from a crash or incident or anything that happens, of, you know, whatever airplane thing. It doesn't go to the FBI immediately ever, except on 9/11, and the FBI ran immediately to not just the people that accepted phone calls to grab their caller ID that said Tom's cell, but and others, Peter's cell phone number, uh, from calling from the plane. Not only did they do that, but they went immediately to all the air traffic control centers and towers and pulled the tapes. Some of them got destroyed. Now you have to ask yourself, why? Why? When the normal procedure is the, them to get it third or fourth hand down the line, did they, why did all protocol get broken that day? Well, because they were covering it up. And it was so poorly done that, and, and I honestly, working with the crew members, I don't know if they just didn't listen to them. They thought they knew better or, or they just weren't uh, asked to, you know, what do you think? Is this going to fly? Because if they would have ran it past me, I would have said, hey, wait a minute, there's this, 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 and this is a flaw. So that's why we saw stuff. And I'm seeing from the crew members through the phone calls, we had five flight attendants call. Only one of them called somewhat of a correct number. And, and that's just unheard of. So you had crew members calling out that were well-trained in a really step-by-step -step protocol to follow doing the wrong thing. And what did they do? Every one of them called their parents or their spouse to say, honey, I love you. Goodbye. I see you in heaven. I mean, that's not what a flight attendant would do. And recently I watched a movie, an old movie. I'm an old movie person. And it was a Wesley Snipes movie. I think it was called Drop Zone. And in that movie, uh, there's a hijacking. There's a bunch of uh, terrorists on, on board. Uh, what's his name with the big teeth? Gary Busey's in it. Um, not very good with Hollywood stars. But there's a flight attendant there that picks up the interphone. They're in a 747, by the way. So that's kind of cool. And they actually are recognized it immediately. She picks up an interphone. So you can see what that phone would look like. That's what the air phone looked like, too. And the hijacker sees her put that receiver to her ear, boom, he shoots her. And I, <laughs> I was like, yep, that's why in the protocol, we would never have made phone calls from the airplane if there were hijackers on the plane. Well, you know, I saw an old movie uh, not too long ago because uh, you mentioned something that kind of triggered this in me. <clears throat> it, I think it was called Breach. And it was about uh, Robert Hansen, the uh, spy in the FBI. And you mentioned that the FBI always thinks they know about her. And this was a classic example of this guy. He, you know, was a spy for the Russians for a number of years. They finally caught him. But he always thought he knew better. He Not only did he know better than the public, he knew better than everybody in the FBI. I mean, they are so egocentric that it's, it's easy to understand how it is they screwed up covering up 9-11, and you've been able to find so many things. Yeah, that's true. And they're continuing to screw up with uh, all the text messaging between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and others in the FBI that were trying to literally uh, put together a coup against Donald Trump and put Hillary Clinton in the White House against how the public voted. Well, once again, it's the timeline that they never have quite right because they're trying to do things outside of the timeline and the timeline always, always nails them. And if you look at what it is that these congressional 
committees are going after. They're trying to get information that will help them put together the exact timeline and then they can nail these guys for whatever it was that they did. And again, I think that's what goes for another uh, part of what I think is that the FBI is just so corrupt. Well, they certainly are, and they really aren't very good at that cover-up stuff either. I mean, I'm not like a genius or anything, although I do have pretty high IQ. Um, I, when I just started to see this stuff, and I couldn't understand why everybody else didn't see it. Partly, I think a lot of it is the big threat to the troopers is that I have the eyes of a flight attendant and the training. So I know what happens when you shoot an airplane in a pressurized cabin. I know what happens if you shoot mace in a pressurized cabin. I know where it's going to go and I know who it's going to affect. And I know that none of the hijackers had gas masks on. Yeah, I do know that. Uh, but I'll, also, you know, the pilots do have a, a kind of a tight-fitting oxygen mask, kind of, you know, fighter jet pilot kind of masks that fit tightly around their face. Um, so maybe, um, you know, they messed up. But other than that, you would, the hijackers would have had done that <laughs> gas themselves. I mean, it's just crazy. And the fact that the people that were talking about the mace or pepper spray, um, and then they gave away other, other details too. The other guy that called in, uh, well, first off, let me finish that sentence. The people that talked about pepper spray or mace never complained that it was affecting them. It was only affecting other people somewhere else on the plane. But the other guy that called out of United 175, he was a actually a radar intercept pilot, Tomcat uh, pilot. And, um, you know, he was sitting there looking at Newark International for a five to 7,000 foot elevation. I mean, it's really easy to see Newark. It's a big airport and there's a uh, harbor right there. It's, it's uh, you know it. If you've ever, ever been in New York area, you know Newark. And the tower's right there. I mean, the river's right there. Everything's right there. And he, for some reason, this pilot, told his mother that he thought that he was over Ohio. Well, obviously he wasn't on that plane. Now was he? Because I have pictures that a flight attendant from American Airlines took out the window of exactly what he was looking at. I've got it and I'm going to put it up. I'm going to do, as soon as this book's out, I'm going to beef up the membership site with some of the data that I have so that you can see it. And that's one of the things I think you'll be fascinated by because this is uh, Brian Sweeney's view that he said he thought he was over Ohio. And you can see it's very industrial all around <laughs> Newark, uh, Liberty Airport. And you can see what he was seeing from the, the exact view from the window. Are you trying to say that Ohio doesn't look like New York? Nothing like Newark. <laughs> so, but why would he say that? It's just like Peter Hansen saying, oh, here's another thing. Peter Hansen said, well, he thought they were going to fly him to Chicago and into a building. Well, nobody would ever have dreamed such a thing. And the hijackers, the 19 accused people they want you to believe is high, none of them spoke English well enough to communicate that. Nobody would tell a passenger what their intentions were because that passenger could pick up the phone just like Peter Hansen did. And obviously scramble jets get the you know whole plane shot down and foil their programs this is just not how things work and so then when brian sweeney who thought he was over ohio he also made another boo-boo he said to his mother now i found this in a 302 by the fbi she told the fbi not me his mom that they were going to try to take over the cockpit from the hijackers at nine o'clock supposedly three minutes before supposed impact where he was over Newark, over the Hudson river. And they were about 5,000 foot elevation. And he thought he was in Ohio. So how did he know that that was the scenario for flight 93, the let's roll scenario, because that didn't happen either, but somebody had to have told Brian Sweeney, military guy working for MITRE shadow government, Somebody had to tell him the scenario for all four planes, or he would never have known that because on that particular flight, uh, and just like on flight 11, the passengers didn't even know what was going on accord, except for those two guys making phone calls. Yeah. Imagine that. Now that's another, ooh, ooh that's wrong. That's, there's a mistake here. Now, uh, on that particular plane also, 
there was supposedly some flight attendant that picked up an air phone and called a maintenance center, but there's so much nebulous back and forth, n not real information that it really never made it into the uh, official story. Now, that could have happened by somebody who realized that they were not going where they were supposed to. Because don't don't forget this. All flight attendants want to land where their <laughs> their overnight destination is because we all have plans there. I mean, you fly a trip because you like to go to your favorite restaurant for dinner, or you have a, an aunt and uncle there, or you have a brother or sister, or you have a shopping center there, or an outlet mall, or something. There's always something that you're you're always going to the same place if you fly the same stuff all the time. So we always want to. I mean, there's just crazy stuff. I mean, you can go to one city and there's the best tacos in the world there and you know in a little hole in the wall place and that's where you're going to go. So when something pops up like this and they land you in Western Massachusetts, you might not be happy about it if you weren't in on the story. Uh, so I think maybe this guy wasn't in on the story and he picked up the phone and called maintenance and kind of coughed out something about hijacking, but it was so confusing. Again, not direct, not following protocol, uh, but it just kind of made it. There's a little flash in the pan information coming from that uh, guy who they can't tell if he's a guy or a girl. I mean, it's just, just very, it's poorly done. It, with the whole thing was so poorly done. Okay, so back to the books. Um, the books are on sale in my online bookstore. You can go to any one of the book uh, websites. They're all actually going to be updated uh, around the middle of August too. So you'll see some, there's really, they're going to all be cool. Um, so uh, at the time of the launching of the website for the fourth book, uh, all the other websites will be made new. So um, hopefully everything works there. And so you can link to everything. Everything links to each other. And there's probably be about 10 web pages all linked together. And so you can go, you know, to the book websites for each four books. You can click on and go to the store. Their softback sets are $39 US dollars right now. And if you're international and you want them, I just sent a... Uh, that's for all three books. That's not a piece. That's right. $39 for, for the set, for the three set. We don't have the fourth book in for a four book set. But what I think I'm going to do is a couple different things. I think what I'm going to do, so just so you know this, is I'm going to put book one and two together as a special price and then book three and four as a special price. So you don't, you save money if you buy more than one and you can read them pretty quickly. So, uh, and then I'll do a four book set. And so that's kind of, that'll show up in the store, uh, probably around the third week of August or maybe halfway through August. And then you can, you know, save some money over Amazon by buying autographed books and they come with, uh, you know, laminated, uh, bookmarks and uh, vinyl window stickers so you can help promote uh, the books, the 9-11 Truth and that sort of thing. Also, if you want to put them on, every book gets a vinyl window sticker. So uh, if you want to put them on your computer or on your back into your car, what have you, so people can go to the readroth.com website and see, hey, I already knew there was a, something more to this story. I'm a, I can't tell you how many people have contacted me. I always knew after pen, the Pentagon and Shanksville that this story sucked. <laughs> there was more to I just couldn't figure and it out. And Building 7. <laughs> yes, and Building 7. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's another thing I have, and I'm going to do this too. I've uh, collected and I found a file on one of my computers, uh, I collected a whole bunch of videos. So I'm going to put those in uh, for the members also that uh, you can see one of them is a, um, a video and actually just talked to, not too long ago with a um, city official from New York City that was told around one in the afternoon that building seven was going to come down. Remember, it came down like much like a controlled demolition around 520 that afternoon. But somebody in the city, somebody knew uh, that it was actually going to come down. And so that early, four hours before. So you got to have to wonder about that whole story, don't we? And isn't it fascinating, too, that Building 7 just did, I mean, a lot of people still to this day don't even know that Building 7 came down looking just like a controlled demolition. Well, I've got a few really good videos uh, from 9-11, from helicopters, that's things I've found. I'm going to put those in as soon as I have a little bit more time because this part, what I'm doing now, is... Uh, 
self-editing. I, I have to edit everything and put everything together, line it all up before it goes to the professional. So it's very time consuming. Uh, and it's it's just a very, this is the hard work of writing a book. I know everybody says, I'd like to write a book. Well, you have no idea how much goes into this. So anyway, it's uh, lots and lots of hours. And, um, you know, I've got my little schedule here. So I have a date with the, my professional editor. <laughs> and then once that happens, I have to go through and again, uh, accept or reject, uh, understand what, uh, if she's got a point of confusion, uh, make something clearer, uh, accept all the, you know, if there's a grammar uh, addition change or what have you, uh, spelling error, what have you, she's pretty darn good at this stuff. And then do that. And then it just moves on from there. And it goes pretty quick after that, actually. So, uh, but this part is the hard part. This is where, uh, I mean, I edit till I literally can't focus my eyes anymore. And, and then have to go do something like go watch an old movie <laughs> on a very large television screen. <laughs> but um, yeah, my eyes, it gets really hard because you, you spend so much time. And I even have a pair of glasses that are just for uh, computer work still. It just, it's a, uh, it's stressful and it's time consuming and it's hard. It's just really, really hard work. So I know people think, everybody thinks it's easy, but it really isn't easy, especially so you know that the 9-11 stuff, is real and it's based on experience from mine myself or other people that have joined me so uh the characters are 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 the fiction part the, the storyline is the fiction part but this the 9 11 information is really based on real stuff so uh when you wake up from there well we'll meet you over at behind the galley curtain i'm going to set up a uh, some kind of, well, there's a chat room over there where you can come in and I'll be in there a lot more and we're going to do more interactive shows. Our daily shows will be more interactive, I think. And, um, we'll do something. I think we're going to do a longer show on our daily also. So, um, we'll just have it all figured out and, and it's a nice place to go. A lot of people like it because when we do our daily news show, uh, we kind of dissect through stuff and it's not like you're going to get on Fox or CNN or ABC or NBC. It's, uh, it's just not, it's not fake news. It's, we try to cover, uh, stuff truthfully and help you understand, uh, who's who at the zoo and who's pulling the strings because it, it is, it is what it is. Okay. Here's the little homework assignment and we're going to be done. All the, uh, websites are in the description box down below. And if you've never read, go ahead and write this down. You want to read up on Operation Northwoods, Operation Mockingbird, and you'll have a little bit better understanding of the manipulation every single and even some alternative shows, uh, the larger ones, are controlling the narrative and they are manipulating how you think about not just 9-11 but other groups of people other religions other uh, societies and cultures and and the like and they have a long history of doing so so there you go thanks for joining us and we'll see you over at behindthegalleycurtain.com <music>